Good morning to everyone in the room and joining us on live stream. My name is Deb Kleber Struzina, and for the last 17 years, I have been a caregiver for two children with Bichette's. My daughter was diagnosed when she was 20. She's now 37 and has three perfect children, I should say. And um, my son's diagnosis was a byproduct of his sister's. Uh, he was seven at the time, but he had been symptomatic since infancy. So that was, her diagnosis was the aha for his doctors um, when he was seven. He's now 24. I am also the president of the American Bichette's Disease Association. And in a shameless plug, I want to say that I am the volunteer president of the American Bichette's Disease Association or the ABDA or ABDA. Um, because everyone on the ABDA board is a volunteer. So my shameless plug comes now. <laughs> Thank you, but if you, um, if you enjoy these events, if you've benefited from the Vasculitis Foundation or the ABDA, I would ask everyone here in the audience and in the live stream to consider whether or not this is your year to carve out time to give back to the Bichette's community because these events and these organizations cannot continue uh, unless you folks are the fresh new wave uh, of volunteers. So check out our website and click on that. I'd like to know more about volunteering and we'd love to get back to you. So that's my introduction. Let's see who's here. Um, just why don't you go through and give your name, where you live, and then we'll jump into our questions. Awesome. Um, hi, my name is Elisa Urkus, and I live here in Atlanta, Georgia. And my name is Ashley Pelletier. I am from Philadelphia, and I live in Bucks County. Hi, I'm Nick Kaiser. I live in Pennsylvania. I'm Ashley's boyfriend as well as caregiver. All right, so we're going to jump into our questions, and I know they're also collecting questions from the live stream, so feel free to, to join in there, please. And this is for our Bichette's patients, Elisa and Ashley. In your own words, can you walk us through your personal journey to receiving your diagnosis? And um, also secondarily, how did you find the right doctor? Sure, so um, my journey started when I was little. Uh, I was seven years old when I got the mouth ulcers that are <coughs> indicative of Bichette's. But uh, my grandmother had had them, so we just kind of treated them as normal and moved on. Uh, my main symptoms, the cluster of symptoms, uh, started at 15 years old, and I got severe after a, a eight-hour overnight car ride up to Virginia in 2010 at 19 years old. Um, at that point, I got much more uh, stubborn about getting a diagnosis, and I started seeing specialists from GIs to rheumatologists to dermatologists uh, trying to find a diagnosis um, and I had a hard time getting a diagnosis here in the States um, and at the time I was separated from my husband he was in the military so I decided to drop out of college and go to Germany and be with him and so I started seeing German doctors in Europe uh, both American and German doctors, I should say. And at 23 years old, during a hospitalization for uh, chest pain, uh, they put me in the heart attack ward, assuming that that's what was going on. Uh, I had a lead rheumatologist of a German hospital take on my case. And that's the, the person who finally spent the time, looked at my body as a whole, and figured out that I had Bichette's disease. Yep, so uh, my journey actually started when I was 19. I'm 22 now. Um, I, the first symptom that I got was um, genital ulcers. So um, I woke up one day and I had a few bumps on my genital. Um, and they weren't ulcers yet. And um, I kind of just uh, played it off. Um, I had joint pain leading up to that, severe fatigue. Again, really didn't connect that. Um, thought it was just my diet, you know, overworking. And then, 
Um, I woke up the next morning and the lesions has, had ulcerated. And you know, the first thing you think is uh, herpes when you speak to a doctor. So I went to um, an urgent care actually because I, they were so, so, so severely painful. I was shaking, I had a fever. Um, so they took one look at them and they said, you know, you, I, you have herpes, we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna swab the open lesions um, and that'll be able to tell us. But I went home and they had, again, overnight had spread um, down to my thighs. They had um, gotten bigger, deeper. So I, uh, they gave me, when I went to patient first, they gave me the antiviral medication right then and there um, for herpes before knowing um, the test ended up coming up negative. That's usually people's journey. Um, but I went back three days later to the same patient first because I was, again, in severe pain. Um, now the antiviral medication had run out with those three days. Um, so they told me that the test came back negative for the, the swab of the open lesion, but I still had herpes. And um, they told me that I should see my OBGYN and start suppressive therapy for um, the herpes um, because the flare seemed to be so severe. And now, fast forward nine months, I was being treated with antiviral medication twice a day, suppressive therapy. Um, I was severely ill, but I started to get mouth ulcers. Then I was accused of, you know, having um, sex with my partner, and I did it to myself, and I gave myself the herpes in my mouth now. Um, mind you, he came up negative for herpes as well. Like, he had never had any symptoms or anything, so for the whole nine months, it was just based off of what the urgent care said. Even though my OBGYN had been my doctor for years, she really didn't question it. So um, after that, I started to get the oral ulcer, skin lesions, and just I knew something wasn't right. Um, I pressed my primary to give me some answers. She's told me to go to infectious disease. I saw an infectious disease doctor, and um, she really, she said, you know, what I think you have is Bichette's disease, but you need to see a rheumatologist. So at that point, I didn't know how complex Bichette's was, and a Google search didn't do it any justice. So um, I found a rheumatologist myself, and then he let me know, you know, I really know nothing about Bichette's. I learned about it in med school. You're going to be a guinea pig for a little bit. He used those words so that I could find, he could find the right, um, medication for me, and that kind of was a mess. After six months, he, he gave up. It got too complex for him. He said, I can no longer um, treat you. I don't feel comfortable. So from then on, I basically had to become um, my own quarterback. I found my own doctors, did my own research, purchased some literature on Bichette's, learned about it that way. And um, basically from there, it took about two more years or a year and a half to actually get a diagnosis. Now I found a Bichette's Center in New York close to me. Um, no, but you know, no one was willing to put those together. I went through 30 to 40 doctors in that period of time and I was told I was crazy. Um, you know, my symptoms are psychosomatic and I'm causing this to myself. So basically, um, I had to just be my own advocate. I had to fight, I had to fight, and I knew something was um, really not right. So it wasn't until recently I got my official diagnosis, but I knew this is what it was this whole time. Yeah, there are a lot of heads nodding, I can yeah. see that. Yes. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> that I have connected with has almost yeah. had the same, similar story, yeah. and... Yeah, and it's nice to know that you're not alone, so I think that's really key. So Nick, as a caregiver, why don't you just talk a little bit about how that has impacted you? Yeah, so I was 21 when Ashley first started getting sick. So it kind of caught us all in the world when we were newly dating. So this was all so new to us. Um, over time, I would say the mental strength that it gave me is because I have to be there for her and this is what I have to do. Um, it made me realize that I shouldn't be taking life for granted and it's, um, there's a lot more important things like Ashley's health that are really important in this world, so, yeah. All right, so how has your life changed since the diagnosis? And there's a lot of two-part questions here, so I'll help you if we go along. And also, um, how does the Bichette's disease affect your daily life and relationship? question, the first one, um, there's definitely positives and negatives to being diagnosed with Bichette's disease. 
a positive is, you know, I was, you know, from 15 to 23, I had symptoms that I had no idea what I was dealing with. I had no idea where it was going to go. Um, and I wasn't being validated as a patient. So at 23 years old, after eight years of being undiagnosed, that diagnosis validated my, my experience and it gave me a little bit of an outline of what I would experience or what I could experience within my Bichette's disease journey. So that was very empowering. Um, uh, one of the cons, one of the negative sides of uh, having Bichette's disease that I've really found or having a diagnosis is over time, um, the, the people in my life uh, the friends in my life that I had from before the diagnosis have a really hard time connecting with me on the same level now that I have the diagnosis. And don't get me wrong, I love these people just the same amount as I did before. But um, when we get together and you know we're talking about you know the hikes they went on and um, the, the bars they went to the night yeah. before, I'm going, oh yeah, I had pain at 9 p.m. last night and had to go to bed. So it's, it can make a very awkward situation and it, it, it's definitely been um, a journey for me of learning of how to reconnect with those people. How to reconnect with those people in a different way now that I am a different person with this diagnosis. And that does tie into your second question about the, the daily life. Um, Daily life has changed that in that, um, you know, pre-diagnosis, pre-eight-hour car ride that caused my chronic pain and my severe symptoms, I was a workaholic. I, uh, I was going to school full-time. I was uh, president of a sorority on campus. I was working full-time and I had a boyfriend in the army. I was doing, I, I was filling every minute of every day that I can, that I, that I could. And post-diagnosis, that is absolutely not possible. No matter how much mental strength I have, I cannot put on paper the schedule that I used to. Um, and you know, it, it it's taken a long time for me to learn and to accept that. And to accept that that, that doesn't make me um, lesser of a human being. That, you know, my, the money that I make isn't, the money that I make and the work that I achieve isn't what matters in society. That's not, that's not the part of me that matters the most. Um, what, what matters is how I treat people and, and you know, how I spend the hours that I do have. So, um, yeah, you know, there's pros and cons. Uh, would I go back to being undiagnosed? Excuse my language. Heck no. Uh, absolutely love being on this side. So, uh, yeah, that's about it of that lovely question. I agree. Um, oh, I agree with everything that she said, but um, more so I've learned to slow down, take it easy. It doesn't matter about my age. I don't want to compare myself to my peers. Um, going back to friends, the people that I used to have connections with, yeah, they fell through the cracks. I don't have connections with them um, much anymore, and I didn't force that. I'm not going to put myself into a situation where I'm unhappy or I feel like, you know, who are these people to me anymore? We don't have the same interests. We can't go out and do the same things. So I think the diagnosis helped me. Um, at first I felt extremely alone, like am I, am, um, is this real or can I just not keep up with the people around me? I mean, I was going to school. Um, I was in school for psychology. I was working full time to pay for school. So, you know, I was pushing myself too and I've learned um, I can't compare my, myself now to my old body. I'm completely different, um, but in some of the best ways. Um, 
definitely gave me uh, the mental strength that I have today, as Nick was saying as well. Um, as far as daily tasks, um, I've learned to really, really pace myself with the simplest of tasks because um, that will exacerbate your symptoms. And as far as like laundry, um, carrying things up and down the steps or things, I, you know what, if I have to pause halfway up the steps, I have to pause, or if I can't do it that day, I can't do it, but it's really important to surround yourself with people that don't make you feel guilty for that. You're not lazy, um, and there, it, there is such a hard thing that I've dealt with um, of where people were like, oh, well, you used to be able to do this, or you did that yesterday. How come you can't do it today? It's very, very, very different than um, what people imagine in their head that you used to be like. Um, so again, it's it's not all bad though. It's not all bad. There's a positive. Look where we're at now. Yeah. Exactly. I want to ask you that same question. So how has your life changed? Yeah, um, it's changed a lot. But me and Ashley have a great understanding of um, our time and what means a lot to us. So we're big Sixers fans. So we'll go to all Sixers games. Still, music. We love concerts. We just do it with limitations now, such as elevators going up the step instead of steps or special seating and stuff like that. So we still make time day to day of what we love to do and we don't let this disease kind of just take over us as a whole day to day, so. Great, okay, I'm gonna ask this next question to Elisa and Ashley again, but we're gonna start with Ashley because we're gonna mix it up sure. a little bit here. So how do you cope with the stress and the emotional toll uh, associated with living with a chronic disease? In the last panel we talked a lot about the chronic, but and specifically what tips do you have for coping on a bad day? Um, I use, I love to write. So I actually created my own blog and use that as like an outlet um, to not only educate my peers, um, but also use that as like a coping mechanism for me. Um, also, I still, like Nick said, enjoy the same things, but maybe at a slower pace. Um, we really love music, we like to go to concerts, but you know what, sometimes I have to pay extra money to sit down now, and that is still coping with the stress because you, sometimes you feel overwhelmed and you, like this disease um, dictates your entire life, which you know it does, being chronically ill, um, it's like it affects every aspect of your life, but um, you have to learn to take time to enjoy the things that you once did, and those are stress relievers, and be really kind to yourself. Um, as far as tips, um, I will always, always, always say outside support groups. Um, that was one of the big things. I was lucky to find um, somewhat early on. That's what's also um, really great about social media. I know people aren't big fans of social media, but that's where I got my following today of people that reach out to me that are like, I didn't even know there was somebody else around there with Bichette's. And um, I actually just spoke to someone that I know that is uh, lives very close to me. So if um, you ever find someone that's near you, connect with them, make friends with them, and you'll feel less alone. Lisa, question for you then. Same thing, how do you cope with the stress and emotional toll, and what tips do you have for coping on a bad day? Yeah, so um, overall, the biggest thing that I do in terms of coping with my chronic illness that really helps, and I can tell when I don't do it, it I, I, I can really tell, is pacing. Um, I, I act like it's this newfangled thing I, because it sounds to me like this newfangled therapy, but it's, it's exactly what the word is. I pace myself. Um, I figured out that I can do about three hours of active active stuff a day. That's about how much I can do. And so, um, you know, yesterday is a great example. I had a doctor's appointment in the morning, and then I had um, meetings for this yesterday afternoon and evening. So I knew in the middle I needed to do, I needed to pace myself, which meant a very long nap, particularly for yesterday. Um, and you know, day to day, you know, the more I do that, the better that I feel, and actually the more work that I'm able to get done, or the more, the more activities that I'm able to enjoy, because if I, if I kind of not do that, if I, if I kind of just let my, uh, if I kind of just, do whatever feels feels natural in the moment i can i can definitely accidentally push myself easily because i very much mentally tell myself that i'm not doing enough I'm not hanging out with my husband enough i'm not seeing my friends enough i'm not doing this enough and so um 
it's just super helpful for me. And um, that's why I love, I just, it's, it's something that I, I really hope others uh, can at least try to do because it's something that I found just super life-changing. Um, in terms of bad days, um, you know, I have a toolkit that I have. I have like a mental toolkit um, for the bad days because when you're physically feeling bad, you're not mentally feeling good either. And um, on those days, I have things like I have adult coloring books and colored pencils. I have funny movies from my favorite um, my favorite com comedians. I have um, I have my my support group friends, my local people that I know that I can reach out to, who can even bring me things if I need them. Just drills down to just take time for yourself on those bad days so that you can be there as much as you can on the better days. Yeah. I love that and I, I like the idea of focusing on what you can do, not versus what, what you can't do because it, it uh, Lisa and I were talking yesterday about about that. You could focus on, I can't do this eight hours a day or 12 hours a day anymore, but I can do it three. And it can totally changes in your, in your head mm -hmm. when you focus on what you can do. My daughter's uh, motto is, I have Bichette's, but it doesn't have me. Same sort of thing, right? So she's just focusing on the positive. Uh, Nick, I'm going to ask you a, a similar question, uh, which is, you know, uh, chronic disease takes a toll on the, the friends, the families, the, the caregivers. So how do you deal with that, that stress and what coping mechanisms do you yeah. have? Um, for me, patience is a big thing. Um, patience and understanding that um, you can't take their pain away, but the task that you do will make such a difference for them, whether that's taking out the, the you know, doing laundry, taking out the trash, making their bed, or even just running the Walgreens and grabbing something that they need. That stuff goes such a long way, and um, listening, and basically, like how Ashley said, she's our own quarterback. I like to consider myself like the head coach. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like overseeing everything, and um, yeah, basically that. Yeah, he's pretty awesome. Isn't he? yeah. Okay, <laughs> all right. So uh, again, this is a question that, that was uh, a little bit to the medical panel too, so it, it'll be fun to, to do this here, but we realize that everyone's experience is different. I think we've, we've gotten that theme here today, but are there any lifestyle changes that you've made that have helped you manage your flare-ups or significantly improved your quality of life? So I'm gonna start with Elisa this time. So this was a hard question to think about whenever it was presented to me because overall I don't think I've done much in terms of long-term changes, but I do, I do know that I saw a difference when I went onto a diet that was mostly organic, and that was something that made a big difference for me. Um, and I was in Germany at the time, which is much easier, but it has gotten to the point here where it's, it's easier as well just to kind of eat in a, in a fashion where it's more, um, more organic. And so that's something that definitely helps me. Um, I also take uh, turmeric, which is a supplement. And um, both of these things, uh, you know, these things were, you know, approved by my care team. They were, they were checked, you know, all of my medications were checked beforehand. These things were, you know, I didn't just kind of like on a whim just decide to um, try these things and, and go forward. Um, so yeah, other than that, you know, and, and the pacing, I love the pacing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, other than that, uh, not, really, not really much in that. Okay, no, that's, that's a lot. And Ashley, you, lifestyle changes to manage the flare? Or yeah. improve your quality of life? Um, so I know everybody hates to hear, you know, diet or exercise, which I, um, I try to incorporate as many anti-inflammatory foods into my diet. Do I love burgers? Do I love french fries? Do I love all the bad food? Yes. But um, I've learned that uh, fueling my body at least one to two meals a day with full just just good stuff for your body uh, that has controlled flares and has also helped when I am in a flare um, it calms down the inflammation in your body you, I can I can actually feel that now long term I haven't really found anything um, that you know I'm sticking with a hardcore diet or hardcore anything like that but also a huge thing is sleep um, 
you have to make sure you're getting, I know like you can wake up and you could still feel not well rested. I understand that's part of it, um, but at least give yourself some time. Um, I don't, I don't want to be like eight hours a day, what, but just try um, and the naps are huge. So um, I used to be a person that I would just go, 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 go. But, you know, take a nap or um, eat something healthy and it'll, it'll pay off. Um, and like Nick was saying, just the little changes. Um, I know you might be feeling okay in the moment to walk uh, multiple flights of stairs, but you might hate yourself afterwards. You might want to opt out for the elevator and say, you know what, I don't care what anyone, if anyone looks at me, or because I was always worried about that. Like, why is this young girl taking um, an elevator? She shouldn't to go up um, one floor of the mall. And it's like, I don't have to, I don't owe that to anybody. And those are little small lifestyle changes that has made a huge difference in the way I feel feel um, during a flare and when I'm trying to prevent flares. Okay. And Nick, as the head coach, anything you see <laughs> as you like lifestyle changes that can help her manage flares, anything you see from your side that yeah, makes a I difference? Yeah, especially with the diet thing because we'll have times where we have to take a flight or something like that and she'll prep the whole week. It's like, all right, we're going to be on it today, this week, and we're going to make sure we're going to take the proper precautions where I'm not feeling like terrible by the time we get, get there or even at the airport or when you land, it's just taking all the proper precautions and understanding that is such a big thing for me. Good, okay. All right, so again, back to our patients here. Um, are there any preventative measures? We'll start with Ashley, because she's got a mic. Um, are there preventative measures that you think make a difference? Yes, it's like like I touched on the taking the elevator if you need to, or um, there are certain things that I know that's going to trigger me. Um, I love my coffee, and I, I it, we have such a bad relationship because that does um, really make me flare. Um, alcohol or bad foods, um, you know it. I, I love those things, but sometimes, like Nick said, if I know I have to, I have an obligation. You know, I need to probably stay away as I chugged four cups of coffee this morning, but um, I there are some things, and it's different for everybody. I mean, you guys, it, coffee might not um, affect you in any way, but I have found just listen to your body, and you will find those little preventative um, things that you can do to, um, you know, learn what, what triggers you, what doesn't. Yeah, triggers, I think that's really true. I think lots of people nodding their heads, too, and you, and you get better with that over time, actually, to yeah. understand that. Yeah. How about you, Elisa? So uh, my main preventative is pretty simple. I make sure I take my medications on time. Um, I make sure that, uh, you know, as, as much as I can, I make sure that my, my team and I have refills set up and, we, and I have my, my meds when I need them and I take the medications that I am prescribed. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that is not as easy as it sounds. No. Yeah. True. There are times where yeah. I'm like, oh, I don't want to take these anymore. Yeah. Um, uh, triggers is, uh, is a great topic because, um, you know, there are triggers that I have where it preventively, if I avoid them, uh, it does help. Uh, I, in particular, have chronic abdominal pain that um, came from a Bichette's flare and it has stuck around the entire, it's stuck around constantly for eight years, no, eight, nine, nine years at this point. Um, and I found that uh, certain foods make that abdominal pain worse. Grits, rice, um, that kind of thing. So yeah, I, I have to make sure that, you know, certain things aren't in my diet, um, just to make sure that I can avoid uh, pain where possible. Okay. Great. All right, a little bit of a switch here. So what is one thing that you wish people would understand about living with or caring for uh, someone with Bichette's? One thing you wish people would understand. I look a lot healthier mm. than I am. Hallelujah. <laughs> 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 yeah. that's, that's true. Uh, I can um, very candidly tell you that I am in the middle of a chronic migraine flare where every loud and high-pitched noise causes pain. That's fine. No more clapping. No, so I'm... 
and that's just part of the process, mm -hmm. but it's just an example of, you know, there are emotional walls that can be put up in situations to make yourself seem healthier than you are. But at the same time, you know, that just that, that uh, the ground level thing, you know, I look completely different than, than I am in terms of health. Um, and that's really hard for people to understand. That's really, really hard. So. Exactly. And, you know, going from that, um, something that, you know, that's even harder to understand, I think, is, you know, when you're, you are a chronic illness patient or a Bichette's patient, I particularly have a hard time fitting in either the healthy people box or the sick people box mm -hmm. because I'm too because I'm too sick to be with the healthy people, but I look too, f too fine to be with the sick people, even, with I have, even when I have my service dog with me. You know, I have, I have um, handicapped aids. Uh, you know, I have, I have a handicap tag. I have, um, I have my service dog. I have things that make it a little bit more visible, but still most people look at me and the parking spot or the dog and then look at me and go, no, something's not right here. And I just kind of go, okay, and then I just keep going. Um, so it's, it's complicated, you know, finding a tribe that really gets you um, can be harder than it seems. Yeah. Okay, and then Ashley, the one thing you wish people would understand about living, it can be more than one, but they wish people would understand about living with budgets. Um, that. I mean, that would be my number one, that if you don't look like you have all this going on, but really inside you're really falling apart. Um, I think I, the complexity of the disease, it, it's, it's so, so crazy how it can, um, it's, it varies from patient to patient, but like I said before, like people will say, you know, well, you did this yesterday or, you know, um, you used to do this years ago, why can't you anymore? I mean, I used to be an athlete. I would run Spartan races for Reebok. I would climb mountains. I would do anything, CrossFit. And, you know, it's it's kind of hard for people to look at me now, even people that I went to high school with or college that seen me in my prime and then look at me now, it's like, um, I've gotten, you know, you're faking this illness or um, I've heard some of the closest people um, to me say that and sometimes not directly to my face. So I want people to know that it is super complex. Every day is different. And um, a lot of things, a lot of people say to me, you know, well, why isn't your treatment working? Or why is this not working for you? It's like, this isn't, there's no magic drug for Bichette's. And sometimes it takes a mixture, like a concoction of, of, of multiple treatments and um, lifestyle changes as well. So that's, um, one thing that I really struggle with and um, I feel like I sometimes try and over validate myself and I, I want to uh, share too much with people because I want them to really know that you know I know what I'm talking about I'm really sick and I'm but yeah, yeah. I, I just wish people knew how complex it, it, it all really is and there's no magic drug or there's no, there's, you're not gonna be fixed right no not, yeah it's broken. like oh you're still sick it's <laughs> yeah, yeah. chronic yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chronically ill. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard. Okay, uh, Nick, I'm going to switch this a little bit for you, but looking back a couple of years ago, what do you wish you knew back then yeah. when uh, Ashley was first diagnosed? Coping mechanisms, ways to communicate with her, her care team? Um, the unpredictability of it. Um, I, will, I often find myself still kind of defending, and like if something, if I'm at, in the middle of the shift mm -hmm. and like something's going on, I have to answer the phone, like, I find myself defending still, and that's still an issue of mine. Hmm. Um, but I'm very fortunate that Ashley knows her body so well, and she is on top of everything. So I go to these doctor's appointments with her. Every consultation, I make sure I'm in there. Like, I have to be. Um, and basically, not all doctors know it all. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Yes, I do. <laughs> We've been through, I mean, we just got diagnosed. I say we. She just got diagnosed. Um, so we've had a constant battle for three years, but it feels like 10, 15. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's excellent. Okay, I, what I'm going to do is go to the live stream. I think we have some questions coming in as well. Okay, so Kathy will.
throw some fresh ones at you. So what resources can I share with my loved ones about Bichette's disease? What resources would you guys recommend? I would absolutely recommend the American Bichette's Disease Association. Um, I, uh, I'm a member and uh, I unfortunately was not a member when I was first diagnosed. And um, the amount of resources that they have is, is, is amazing. And they have things like, um, like videos uh, and PSAs that they have that you can share with your loved ones to kind of give them a little bit more information about how it is to live with Bichette's and what it feels to, to be a Bichette's patient. Um, and yeah, that's a, a, that's a huge one. Um, yeah, so resources that so recommend? there's a couple um, ABDA of course um, the Vasculitis Foundation um, I found both of them um, online but also um, Celgene has um, shared a website called um, if you guys want to write this down it's www.bichettesconnection.com um, you can find a lot of um, useful information on there because I know um, Google is not uh, equipped to um, answer all of your questions so those and support groups find support groups on social media um, they are extremely helpful and in as many as you can get in because not only do you connect with them and feel less alone you also learn more um, because again we are the experts um, we are dealing with the disease the doctors aren't um, so I've learned so much from my peers um, through those yeah. So Ashley, you must be channeling the um, folks on the live stream because that was one of my next questions, is how can patients connect with local support groups? Um, so thank you for mentioning that. The Bichette's and, Connection. Yeah, um, and I think Deb is going to offer some additional resources and it looks like Elisa also has something to add. Yeah. But there are chronic illness and chronic pain support groups that um, that are wonderful because you know while this is a unique disease and it's a rare disease, what we go through can be very similar to other rheumato rheumatologic and autoimmune diseases. So um, I, I see, or I go to um, two different chronic illness and chronic pain um, support groups here in Atlanta, and it doesn't matter that they don't have Bichette's, they get what I go through. For the ABDA, uh, we really recommend the Rare Connect, if you're familiar with that. They have moderated support groups, which can be very helpful. Um, Rare Connect. Yes, and I would, I, I, I'd also, in talking about support groups, I, um, I do like to mention this. You know, the people in support groups, I just remember the people that you'll be working or talking to are often sick and not in their best frame of mind, perhaps are on steroids. So I just want to encourage people when they're in support groups to, to be kind and extend grace to each other and forgive each other if maybe you've responded on a bad day. Um, but let's just remember that we're all in a journey together and, and kindness really goes a long way and forgiveness goes a long way too. So, so uh, I, that's, that's my pitch on the support groups. Excellent points, thank you, thank you. So this last um, live stream question comes through to Nick. Um, Nick, what is the one thing you would tell caregivers about helping a loved one manage Bichette's disease in your head coach role? Yeah, <laughs> um, assemble your care team with them um, kind of like I said earlier, make sure you're in all the doctor's appointments with them just in case, you know, they miss anything or there's something that you would like to add as well that maybe they don't, uh, they didn't add or something like that. Um, and always remember to show love to make sure they don't feel alone because that's like the biggest thing, you know. We can be in the doctor's appointments, but we still have to live day to day. And if you show that love and you make them feel appreciated, they're going to love that and they'll be forever thankful. Brilliant. Brilliant. So was that, was that was the last slide? <laughs> okay. All right, so we have, oh, look, that's so good. All right, so we, we, we asked for Kleenex up here on purpose. Um, I have one last question, and it, uh, again, without any planning at all, it ties into the number one tip from one of the doctors on the earlier panel, but um, what is it that gives you hope for the future? Start with Elisa. Um, possibilities. Possibilities of new treatment, uh, possibilities of uh, better ways to get into remission, um, possibilities of more awareness within the United States. Uh, you know, just that we're here in this summit right now is huge. You know, I've been diagnosed 
um, and I apologize, my service dog is mad that he is not with me. Um, uh, we, you know, being here at this summit, you know, I've been diagnosed for six years now, and I have never seen anything like this. And um, this is just so exciting, and, and it just brings about just where can we go from here, you know? It's just awesome. Great. I definitely second that. Um, I ha it's, it's amazing how uh, medicine is developing um, now that, um, you know, that we're at this summit and the people that are live streaming, they're going to share it with other people. And, you know, the more people that you share it with, the more attention it brings to Bichette's. And it's much needed attention and not just for patients or caregivers, but also the physicians uh, dealing with um, Bichette's. And um, the, I think social media also, I go back to that, like the advocating for this. And I actually um, found Celgene and started advocating um, with them for through social media. I found them on there and it, it opened so many doors and now um, my following, her following, all of you guys that share with your following will also um, now know what Bichette's is. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing. There's so many possibilities and you know, um, your treatments will continue to develop and more attention will be brought to the disease. Great. How about you, Nick? Um. Honestly, this right here, because it's only been three years for me and Ashley, but it feels like it's been going on for a lifetime. Um, seeing all these people in this room makes us not feel alone, and it's so cool to me that this type of stuff goes on. If you told me three years ago we'd be doing this, I would not believe you. I'm like, I would never be yeah. another person with Pachettes. Yeah. So this is amazing to me, and yeah, basically that's the best way to put it, I think. That's great. Yeah, I also want to say in 17 years since you know, I first heard of Bichette's, the, the prognosis is so much better than it was. I was fascinated by the number of people who were diagnosed over 15 years ago. I see people shaking their heads. 15, 17 years ago, it was rather grim. I mean, the, the treatments were much more aggressive. Doctors didn't know what they don't know now about when to treat proactively and how aggressively to treat or unaggressively. So uh, the hope in that, 17 years from now, where, you know, where will we be? Uh, you know, my daughter had her three children uh, in that hope, saying, hey, you know, I've got Bichette, so does my brother, but you know what, things are only getting better, and life is out there, you know, to be lived, so I think that hope is really there. So I would like to give a round of applause to our panelists here. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much for sharing your stories so eloquently, so passionately. Um, I, I think the audience here and those of us online really appreciated it. So um, again, just let, let's give them another round of applause. They did great. <laughs>